one way or another, we're all going to make that trip. It's how you get there that counts. That's this week on Motoring 2001. TSN's Motoring 2001 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas. Keep a good thing going. Go Midas! Hello everybody. You know each week we like to have fun on motoring and I hate to be serious this week, but you know what they say about this life, there are only two things we can be certain of. Death and taxes. And we all know where our tax money goes. As for the Big D, it's a matter of opinion. But this week on Motoring, we're going to meet some men and women who, if you so choose, will be more than happy to take you on your final ride. What we're seeing here today is the 24th International Meet of the Professional Car Society. Now, to some people, they may not have heard that term before. Basically, the Professional Car Society is a preservation of uh, what we call professional chassis vehicles, and they can range from uh, horse-drawn hearses to pre- and post-war automotive hearses, low- and high-top ambulances, uh, limousines, and flower cars. A professional car, loosely defined, is any type of car that has been built on an extended car chassis for the service industry. Real ambulances aren't trucks, and the vehicles they use today are nothing uh, more than a, a box put on a truck chassis, uh, a person with a back injury, they're just bouncing over every bump, whereas in the days of a professional chassis ambulance, whether it be built on a Cadillac, Pontiac, or Oldsmobile chassis and extended, these cars for the most part, the suspension uh, in a lot of the cars was air ride, so if you went over a bump, the car took the ride, not the bump, and not the patient. This is a 1919 REO Speedwagon hearse. It was first used in Bertie Township in the fall of 1918. It was used to replace the horse-drawn hearse that I have in existence at my own place now. It uh, was converted, it was bought as a chassis and converted by the Finch Coach Company into a hearse in 1918. It was used as a horse drawn or as a hearse for 15 years and then it was converted into a pickup truck for delivering furniture. I bought it in 1995 sight unseen from an estate and then searched for two years finding parts and then converted it back into a hearse. It took me three years in total the project. Isn't there a band called REO Speedwagon? REO Speedwagon was named after the car. The engine is the original engine. I had it rebuilt. Uh, my friend Don Belfry across the street uh, rebuilt the engine for me in 1998. We uh, obviously had some time getting parts for it because this, the uh, parts department at Rio was closed. But uh, he found out through friends of his that the um, valves from a 1955 Massey Ferguson tractor would also fit a 1919 Rio. That's why when we started, it sounds more like a tractor than a car. It's a four-cylinder engine. I believe it's a 25 horsepower. This is the original registration plate for this vehicle. If you really read it closely, you'll see that it says overspeeding, overloading, or the use of solid tires will void the warranty. And two lines below that, it'll say that uh, maximum speed is 22 miles per hour. I've never gone over 22 miles an hour because I really didn't want to avoid the warranty. I don't think about what it was used for. I really enjoy the look of the vehicle and the local history surrounded by it. People like to look at these things. They're fascinated by, by the lights. Uh, one of my vehicles, which is a 71 uh, SNS Medic Mark I high top ambulance, which was originally in service in Myerstown, Pennsylvania until 1988, has 24 red lights and four sirens on it. 
extremely impressive looking car and when people see that uh, and they see the color scheme they're immediately attracted to it and, and if they can be convinced that uh, this ambulance has probably saved a lot more lives and carried people to a hospital and it served a useful purpose then they begin to break down those barriers of fear and, and appreciate them for what they were originally built for. Uh. Thirty kilometers an hour? <laughs> I don't think so. More later on Kenzie's Corner. Nice pylon. The other problem is that even goes up against the back seat. Just be careful you don't fall in. She wins. <laughs> You know, the Sebring nameplate has been successful in the past, and so in an attempt to cash in on that popularity, Chrysler has launched a trio of new vehicles. A sedan, another convertible, and this all-new coupe. Despite the common name, the new Sebring trio consists of two distinct platforms powered by different engines. The sedan and convertible are Daimler Chrysler products with Chrysler engines. The coupe is a Mitsubishi platform powered by a pair of Mitsubishi single overhead cam engines. The base unit is a 16 valve 2.4 litre 4 that pumps out 142 horsepower at 5500 rpm and 155 pounds feet of torque at 4000. The up level LXI tested gets a 24 valve 3 litre V6 that produces 200 horsepower at 5500 rpm and a really good 205 pounds feet of torque at 4500 rpm. Now there's no prizes for choosing the right motor. The 4 is lackluster, the 6 a very flexible and willing worker delivering ample power for all situations, especially when teamed with the 5 speed manual transmission. It has a respectable shifter that's not overly vague and a very smooth clutch. Inside the Sebring Coupe pleases a lot as all of the usual comfort and convenience items are all very much present and correct, up to and including a great sounding radio. There are however a couple of pet peeves. First of all, this fake wood, as bad as it is, should have been carried on up through the centre stack. That way they would have broken up this huge black wash that faces you. The other problem is that anyone pushing six feet, well you're going to run out of headroom real fast. <laughs> Stopping power is delivered by a four-wheel disc brake system that now features larger front calipers. The stops are short, measuring just 112 feet from 80k and are also fade-free. The pedal is also easily modulated. You know, believe it or not, anti-lock brakes are an option on this new Sebring, even on the up-level LXI. Now, I consider that to be a major oversight, and Chrysler obviously agree because they thought to equip it on this particular vehicle. And that says a lot more about the situation than I ever can. The new coupe is a significantly tighter vehicle than the one it replaces, as in 90% better in bending strength. This delivers a stiff structure from which the suspension can work. Up front are McPherson struts, a cross brace and a roll bar, while the rear features a double wishbone design, again with a roll bar. Through the pylons, the body rolled a little more than expected. Now this unloads the inside wheel, allowing it to spin in spite of the larger 215-50R17 rubber. Understeer is less of an issue, however. The upside is a very comfortable ride. A minor quibble comes in the form of a gentle drumming that comes from the suspension over expansion joints. That aside, the ride is exceptionally quiet with little engine or wind noise entering the cabin. You know, while the trunk on this Sebring is relatively large, there are a few drawbacks. First of all, the liftover is high, the opening's small, you've got crush anything placed beneath them hinges, and while it's very deep, the problem is, if anything slides up against the back seat, we'll say goodbye to it, because you can hardly get back there. On a more positive note, well, the rear seat will accommodate two adults in relative ease, a third of the push. Getting back there, mind you, well, it's still very much par for the coupe course. On the safety front, the Sebring Coupe gets two next-generation airbags, but strangely not the side curtains found in the sedan. Now, the latter is a function of one car coming from Chrysler, the other not. 
You know, if you're looking for an out-and-out -out sports coupe, this Sebring probably is not the right car for you, as its dynamic demeanor really isn't cut out for the hard and fast stuff. Having said that, as a comfortable cruiser and a very attractive alternative to either the Accord or the Solara, well, it's a very viable proposition. It's a 1957 Pontiac Star Chief convertible. I bought it in 1983. When I first bought it, it was really rough. It needed everything. And I worked on it from 1983 until 1990. And I've been driving it since then. The engine is a 347 V8. It's a very uncommon engine. They were made only in Pontiac, only in 1957 and only in the ones that were assembled in Detroit in the United States. They were not found in the ones that were assembled in Oshawa in Canada. This is the Continental spare tire here. There is a real spare tire in it. And to get at the spare, to get at the trunk, there's a lever here. You pull the lever up and the tire moves out of the way. And that way you can get at the keyhole to get into the trunk, which looks like a trunk of somebody who's on a long trip. At the time I started on the car, I knew very little about mechanics and I learned it by trial and error and mostly error. A lot of things were done two and three times over till they were done right. In the 1950s, all the cars came with oil bath air filters. And this is the oil bath air filter right here. It has motor oil in it. There you can see the motor oil and the engine vacuum sucks the air through the motor oil and the oil absorbs the dirt and particles that a filter normally does. I've done a lot of driving with the car. Some people just hide their cars and don't let anybody see them. They, they take great care to preserve them and so on. I don't. To me, a car is meant to be driven and I drive it. 56 or 57? Our Midas tip of the week concerns rear window defrosters. By all means, use your defroster to defog or defrost the rear glass in your vehicle when necessary. But as soon as the glass is clear, turn it off because these things consume a lot of electrical energy. That's wear and tear in your alternator, and it's also current that can be better used in some cases to bring up the specific gravity or the state of charge of your battery. So don't overdo it. As soon as it's clear, turn it off. A couple of other things to keep in mind, when you're loading cargo into the vehicle, when it's a hatchback like this one, or in the rear cargo shelf, parcel shelf of a regular vehicle, make sure that you don't damage the lines because they're on the inside of the glass. You can actually feel them if you run your hand across the glass. If you gouge or scratch through one of them, the line is ruined. It can be repaired. You can buy a kit at an auto parts store, a little stencil and a, a bottle of semiconductor that you can brush onto the affected area to make a repair, but it's not quite as good as original, so be careful. When you're cleaning the glass, make sure that you go with the lines in this direction, and make sure you don't have any rings or watches on or long fingernails when you're cleaning that glass that might gouge or scratch through the lines. That's your Midas tip of the week. Kind of neat, actually. I uh, got an invite from Goodyear to go down to the uh, Goodyear-sponsored Extreme Rock Crawling Championships uh, being held just outside uh, Phoenix. It's a bit of an eye-opener of an event. Uh, I've done a bit of off-roading over the years, but uh, I've never seen uh, vehicles put through, you know, put through sections of, uh, of rock and terrain and whatnot as extreme as, uh, as these. It really merits the name Extreme Rock Crawling, you know. nine sections of terrain over big rocks in a stream bed, in this case out in the desert, a dry, dry stream bed. And uh, in each section there are flags to, march, to mark a, uh, a course through the, uh, through the section. And uh, the trucks are observed as they drive through. And if they knock over flags, stop or reverse, they lose points. At the end of the day, the chap with the lowest score is the, uh, is the winner, you know, who's made the least uh, mistakes. And, uh, you know, some of the train is, is pretty awesome, you know. The vehicles are, uh, for the most part, uh, standard production vehicles that have been extensively modified. They're Jeeps and uh, uh, compact pickups, you know, 4x4 pickups and full-size 
four by four pickups uh, that have been uh, you know extensively modified lots more ground clearance and lower gearing and uh, heavy duty half shafts and all that sort of thing um, but they don't make uh, a lot of horsepower or anything like that they're uh, designed to be more tractable lots of you know low end grunt to to haul them over these big rocks that they climb over some people may watch this and go are these people out of their minds but what do you what do you it's, it's, it's well, it's, there is certainly an element of danger. Uh, we saw two, uh, well, I saw one, and then there was another vehicle actually rolled over. Um, but the, uh, the speeds are, are very low. There's no sort of you know, racing around. It's all crawling, quite literally. And uh, in a couple of instances, they just kind of got at extreme angles and fell over. Um, mind you, no, they don't wear helmets, and uh, they're only held in by lap belts. So maybe there's a little bit of craziness in there. So. As we all know, a hearse is used to take the coffin to the cemetery. But more and more people, in fact, funeral directors tell me 40 to 50 percent are now choosing cremation, which is causing additional downtime for the hearse. All right, we're now going to join Bill Gardner. We all know that Bill's going to live to he's 100. But you know, Bill, with all these hearses here, which one would you choose for your last road trip? Brad, you're morbid. But you know, now that I think of it, for me, I think just throw my casket in the back of the pickup truck and a case of beer. We'll have the pallbearers right in the tailgate and we'll have uh, the ultimate tailgate party when I get planted. I just don't want to think about it just yet. Anyhow, right now we've got a, an email we want to answer from one of our viewers, Andrew Tolfson. He says he recently purchased a couple of new Nissan Altimas and at a clinic provided by the dealership, the question came up that uh, when driving in the city, you tend to exceed the speed limit from time to time. You may notice the transmission shifting up and down. This, we were told, is the automatic overdrive cutting in and out. In all likelihood, that's exactly what you're feeling. Uh, and we were told that when driving in the city, you should uh, turn off the automatic overdrive. However, last weekend, a friend, mutual friend who works in a transmission shop uh, said the exact opposite, said to leave the automatic overdrive on. What is the correct answer? Well, the reason you've got two very different answers to your question is there's pros and cons to this. You can argue both sides of this topic, so let me tell you what the pros and cons are, and you can base your, uh, your driving accordingly. Now, in a light-duty passenger vehicle like your Nissan Altima, probably one or two passengers and very little cargo, it's probably to your advantage to leave the overdrive enabled. In other words, leave it turned on, even when you're in the city, because quite often you'll get to areas where the you, in the suburbs where the speed limit is, is above 60 kilometers, maybe a 70K zone or an 80K zone in some cases, divided highway, where you, if you forgot to turn the overdrive back on, you'd be giving up a lot of fuel economy. Now, the reason they give you that defeat button to turn the overdrive off, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, if you're trailer towing, it's usually advised that you defeat or turn off the overdrive. But also when you're driving on slippery surfaces like ice or snow-covered roads, you gain a lot more vehicle control by turning the overdrive off because when you lift out of that throttle, you come out of the throttle, the vehicle wants to pull back, wants to slow down. You also save a lot on brakes. And if you're driving in mountainous or hilly ter terrain, a lot of people find that it's extremely advantageous to keep the overdrive turned off. It's kind of like having a standard transmission. When they go down that hill and lift off the throttle, the vehicle doesn't tend to get away on them. And that's probably why it was mentioned in this clinic that it'll help you to uh, adhere to the speed limit by turning it off. The vehicle doesn't get into fourth gear and get away on you. That's probably why they told you that. Now, when you come to a vehicle like this light duty truck, this pickup here, it's a whole different thing. Pickups and vans, when you're towing trailers or operating with a big cargo load, it's usually advised that you defeat the overdrive, turn it off to save wear and tear in the transmission when you're towing that heavy load. Now, one thing that you do want to remember with any automatic transmission, it's much more important to the uh, overall life of that transmission that you service it at the proper intervals. Make sure that you change the fluid and filters, service the transmission, whatever that entails on your particular vehicle at the correct intervals, and you're, you've got a lot better chance of that transmission last, lasting the life of the vehicle. As far as turning it on or off around the city, try it both ways and, and uh, judge your driving accordingly. I think that you're going to find Probably leaving it enabled is probably your best bet. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2001. There are only
only two seasons in Canada, winter and road construction. Now we all get cranky when we get held up at construction sites like this, but we get even crankier if we bust our suspension in some massive pothole. The road construction companies just can't win. Now if you've never stopped your car at the side of a busy highway, you have no idea how fast something like even 80 kilometers an hour feels to these guys. I mean, road work is tough enough without have cars and trucks whizzing past your butt about this far away. I mean, how would you like to have to do your job in the middle of a freeway? Now, I've got very little patience for artificially low speed limits on major roads, but in construction sites, you got no arguments from me. I mean, these places are dangerous. The lanes are different than we're used to. The lane markings are, are non-existent or poorly done. And if there is an emergency, well, you've got nowhere to go. Now, the police are in a bit of a bind trying to enforce speed limits in construction zones. In downtown Toronto the other day, the Metro Police tried to have a radar trap in a construction zone in the Gardner Expressway. But surely, having a cop leap in front of a speeding car in a construction zone makes things more dangerous, not less. Now, I'm afraid it's all going to be down to us. I mean, when's the last time you ever saw a car going the speed limit in a construction zone? This is a 30K zone. He's going at least 60. More to the point, when's the last time you ever slowed down in a construction zone? Let's try to remember to make a pact to follow the advice you see on road signs everywhere around North America. Road workers ahead, let's all give them a break. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, although the judges will be selecting their favorite vehicle here at the International Meet of the Professional Car Society in Kingston, Ontario, we've already picked ours, and this is it. 1959 Cadillac Superior the last year of those beautiful tail fins when a Cadillac needed no nameplate. And they tell me this car had more chrome on it than any other production vehicle. Under the hood, a four barrel 390 V8, 325 horsepower. Well, unlike the hearses, it can be operated no matter what the vintage, 1979 was the last year an ambulance could be built on a car chassis. So hats off to the men and women here who are keeping the memories alive and showing the younger generation that an ambulance and even a hearse can be cool. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 2001 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas!